We've been covering a series here called The Gospel. Beauty, horror, love, wonder, mercy, wrath, and God. We started this back on September 19th. It's been approximately 16 sermons on the gospel. As we as, we as elders talked about doing a sermon series on the gospel, um, I was kind of uh, surprised because I thought we, we, we teach the gospel every, every week. Our songs, the worship songs are about the gospel. I hope that as you come here to hope, you expect to, to hear the gospel on a regular basis because that's we, we all need that. The series started off with the raw gospel. And the elements of the raw gospel are God, us, Jesus, and our response. It's important that we start with the gospel, that we start with God. Many of the gospel messages that you'll hear out there include um, starting with you, starting with your sin problem, starting with what, where, where you're at and how you need God. And while that's helpful to pull people in, to a discussion of the gospel, the gospel starts with God. John Piper in his book, 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die, I think John gets it right. It takes four chapters of, that, of those 50 reasons before John mentions us. And it takes another five chapters before he mentions our sin. So while the gospel does take care of our sin problem, that is absolutely true. It does at least that. It does so much more. But it starts with God. And that's an important progression as we consider the gospel. So as we come to Jesus in our broken, needy state, and we come to Jesus and he takes care of our sin, are we then done with the gospel? And our answer here at Hope is no. We need to continue to preach the gospel to ourselves. So like I said, we've been preaching this gospel Um, We've been going through this sermon series 16 weeks talking about the gospel. Don't we have it figured out? Don't we have it all set? And I say no. Tim Keller has a quote here. It says, One of the signs that you may not grasp the unique, radical nature of the gospel is that you are certain that you do. So if you're sitting here thinking, I've got this gospel all figured out. Come on, let's move on. Let's move on from the gospel. Don't we need to talk about other things? The reality is you don't have your arms around the gospel. It will take your entire life to get your arms around the gospel, and you won't even have it until after you're sitting at the feet of Jesus. The gospel, we will, we will revel in the, in the beauty of the gospel for all eternity. So no, we are not done. We ask ourselves the question, what difference does the gospel make? I found this question to be very helpful as I consider um, relationships that I have, a difficult relationship with a friend, um, talking with someone else. How do I handle this? How do I get through this? I have a friend that asks me often, what difference does the gospel make in that friendship? What difference does it make that Jesus came from heaven, came here, laid down his life, paid for our sin, how should that impact your relationship with that that friend of yours that you're struggling with? It's that act of pulling the gospel in through our lives that we need to do as a community, and I hope we do that here at Hope, is that we continually ask ourselves, each other, these questions. What difference does the gospel make? Martin Luther says, the gospel is center of all Christian doctrine, wherein the knowledge of all godliness consists. Most necessary it is, therefore, that we should know this doctrine well, teach it unto others, and beat it into their heads continually. We need to do that in our lives. And so I say, let the beatings begin. The question I want to uh, ask us tonight is, what difference is the gospel making in your lives? 16 weeks on the gospel... I hope that we're not just sitting in awe of it, but we're actually working with the gospel in our lives. I'm going to be covering uh, Colossians 2, 6 through 3, 17. It's a large passage. There's a lot of words on that screen. I'm not going to read them all, and I don't expect that you can read them all. In fact, there are professionals that cover this passage in six and seven sermons, and I'm going to do it in one. 
That doesn't mean that I'm uh, more of a professional. It actually may mean that I'm just simply foolish. But I'm going to give it a try. And the point here is, there, if you love this passage like I do, there are going to be things as I go through this that I don't touch, that you're going to go, but you missed that point. And I, I know, but I want to hit the high points of this passage so that we pull out of it some things that Paul wants to teach us. So the roadmap kind of for tonight is that we are going to start at the end, which is a dangerous place to start, but I want to I frame the end so that we understand where we're headed. But then we're going to talk about what it means to be in Christ, and then we'll make one particular stop during the passage to see where we don't want to go with the gospel. And then we'll see what we do as a result of being in Christ, and then we'll, see, uh, we'll revisit the end and see how it applies. So again, we're going to start at the end. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Doesn't that, doesn't that sound good? It sounds good, right? Sounds like a, a, a great word picture. So just, you, you go do that. Can we do that? Can we do that on our own? If we start here, if we start here, and if you look at, the, uh, if you look at some of these words in this passage, they are daunting words. Forgive one another as the Lord forgave you. That's a high calling. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do we do that? Can we do that? If we look at this passage and focus on those elements, and we don't consider where those elements come from. It's like watching the Super Bowl trophy be handed off and not having watched the game. You just see the end. This is the end of this passage. This is where it leads to. And in our culture, we are impatient people. If you look at this, I pulled just some quick images off the, off the web. Um, fast food, right? You can get your food in like two minutes, hot, ready for you to eat. Uh, if you go to Jimmy John's, it's freaky fast. Have you ever been there? I've, I've not even done paying, and I've got my sandwich in my hand. It's amazing. They're freaky fast. It's true. But I, I love the one in the upper, upper left corner. Tan in a can. Talk about impatience, right? Netflix. Instant movies. Instant movies. You want to watch that movie? You want to watch it right now? You want to watch it anywhere? You can watch it anywhere. If we apply this same impatience to the gospel in our lives, we will become very, very, very frustrated. The purpose of the gospel, God's purpose in your life is to make you more like Jesus. And that does not happen overnight. God will use your entire life to change you, to shape you, to knock the sharp edges off, to make you more like Jesus. So let's look at how Paul guides us through this. We're going to go back to the beginning of the passage now and see how Paul leads us through the gospel and brings us to that end. Okay? So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. 
There's a patient persistence here, right? Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. This doesn't happen overnight. Rooted and built up. This doesn't happen overnight. We're not rooted and built up overnight. There are some transformations that happen in our lives. Granted, totally understand. There's some things that Jesus comes in and changes right away. That happens. But it's not as common as the long, long journey of Jesus changing us. So we need to have patient persistence with the gospel. There's another element to this very first part of the passage that I want to point out. It says, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. What was your life like before Jesus? What was your life like? Broken? Sinful? Messed up? And then we come to Jesus and we say, Jesus, all this brokenness, all this sin how I messed up, I need you to take care of that. And what does Jesus say? I got it. I got it. I'll take care of it. And if you're anything like me, then when I, when I crossed over that point and I had met Jesus and I wanted to live for Jesus, then it felt like the sins or the, the difficulties that I had after that, somehow I had to take care of them on my own. That's not what this passage says. This passage says, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. So in that exact same way that you brought your sins before you came to Jesus, brought them to him and said, Jesus, I need you to take care of these. When we sin as believers, as people trusting in Christ, when we sin like that, don't try to clean it up on your own. You can't clean it up. You can't fix it. Do what this passage asks you to do. Bring it to Jesus. Continue to live your lives in Jesus. Truth is, hope, you are more wicked than you will ever believe. And you are more loved than you will ever imagine. That's true before the cross, and that's true now. We need Jesus. We need Jesus all the time. So let's continue on. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity... lives in bodily form. In Christ, you have been brought up to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you you, you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. We need to start with our lives in Christ. If we ever want to be transformed by the gospel, we need to get in Christ. That's where it's got to start. If you see things in your life that you you want Jesus to change, you need to get in Christ. So I was really struggling with an illustration here on uh, how to demonstrate or how to bring to light what it means to be in Christ. And I asked my wife, I said, Can, you know, do you have any, any ideas? And uh, she told me today that she, um, I have two illustrations that I'm going to share with you. And she said that the one that she came up with was the best. And, and I, th- I actually think it is. I think it's really good. But um, I've got two illustrations, and we'll try, the, we'll try the happy one first, okay? So the happy one is, is frosting. So with frosting, if you look at the, at the picture on the, on the left there, that's, that's un, untouched frosting, okay? So um, that's our lives without the gospel. And then the gospel enters in 
with a, a drop of, in this case, violet dye, okay? So you can leave that violet dye just sit on the, on, on the frosting, and it will work its way a little bit into the frosting. But we need to... That, so we need to work with the gospel in our lives, and we need to work the gospel into our lives. So I started to stir this, and you see there on, on, the, on the left, you see the, the gospel is starting to work in, right? And that's what happens in our lives. Jesus is very gracious with us with our lives because he uncovers things that he wants to deal with, and he does it very graciously because he doesn't show us all of our sin at once. If Jesus showed you all your sin at once that, you needed, that he needed to take care of in your life, if he showed you all that sin at once, you would be devastated. So he opens up doors and says, here, here, I, I want to I start here. I want to deal with this. One thing I found in my life is that um, as I've prayed for my sons, I pray for them every night, and uh, there was one point uh, where my, my sons were just fighting. They were just bickering with each other. And as I was putting to bed, I, I said, uh, Jesus, I just pray that you, you would help my sons um, deal with their anger. And I felt God say, okay, let's start with you. And it opened, up in my, eye, opened my eyes to how I, I was having an anger problem. And I needed Jesus' gospel to work into my life and touch my life. And he used, he used a prayer that I was praying for my sons to open my eyes to an area that he wanted to touch in my life. So as we continue to work the gospel through our lives, um, asking ourselves, what, what difference does the gospel make? What difference is the gospel making in our lives? Eventually you get to the point where here is, it is on the right, where you cannot distinguish the difference between frosting and dye in that picture. And in the frosting, you can't separate the dye anymore from that frosting. It has become in the frosting. Okay? So if that analogy doesn't work, we'll try this one. Um, it is reported that there was a BMW traveling 160 miles an hour on the Autobahn. And uh, the driver said that all of a sudden he hit something and the car just stopped. He got out, lifted the hood, and found that he had hit a deer And the deer, okay, you can turn the slide now. And the deer is in the car. In the car. It is now indistinguishable there to distinguish. You can turn the slide now. I think people are starting. Yeah, there we go. You can't tell the difference between the engine and the deer in that slide. The deer has become in the car. One of my friends critiqued the analogy. He said, but, but you don't normally want the gospel to actually destroy something. I said, oh, but it didn't destroy it. It transformed it. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Jesus takes care of our sin. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You were dead in your transgressions. You were dead. Dead people cannot help themselves. We were dead in our sins. God transformed us. It says here, he forgave us all our sins. God made you alive with Christ. God did it. You didn't do it. God did it. And I love how in this passage, Paul piles on here. Right? He could have just said, he forgave us all our sins. Would have meant the same thing, right? But Paul goes on to say, he's canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. You are legally in debt. You are bankrupt. You cannot take care of your sin. Only Jesus can take care of your sin. 
Jesus has taken it away. Not only taking it away, he nailed it to the cross. It's taken care of. It's gone. It's done. There's not a sin that you have committed that Jesus can't take care of. And that's true before you come to Jesus, and that's true after. There's not a sin you can commit that is big enough for Jesus to not take care of it. If you say, well, yeah, but Bart, what about this sin? What about this sin? Look at when I did it. What you're saying is, my sin is more powerful than the infinite God being nailed on the cross to pay for that sin. There's not a sin you can commit that Jesus can't take care of. There's not a sin you've committed that he won't cover. If you come to him, repent, lay it at his feet, let him take care of it. One of the marks of the gospel being pulled through our lives as well is that when we sin, we run to Jesus instead of running from him. In Genesis 3, that's the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they sinned, is they hid from God. But as, as people who trust in Jesus, our response should be, when I sin, I'm going to run to Jesus. I'm going to run to him and let him take care of this sin. So here's the point in the passage where we turn and look to see where we don't want to go. Okay? Religion cannot take care of our sin. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And skipping ahead, since you have died with Christ to the to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you were still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations, indeed, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Do you remember this slide? Living from your righteousness, not for righteousness. We, when we are in Christ, we have Christ's righteousness. And from that, we live our lives. Please, please, please avoid the religion approach, which is, I am going to take where I am and live in a way that will please God. I need to figure out how to gain God's favor. I need to gain his favor. That's religion. The gospel tells you about your problem and it solves your problem. You put yourself in Christ and you live out from that. So remember, live from your righteousness, not for your righteousness. So I want to review a couple things here because we're going to go into a section of scripture here that I think, um, it, at least in my history, I've struggled with. So remember, I just want to bring these things to mind again. We need to live our lives in him, as it says in, in 2 verse 6, and then in 2.13, it says, God made you alive with Christ. Okay? Remember those two things as we move forward here because the next section of scripture and actually many Bibles, the next section of scripture is titled Rules for Holy Living. And if you read it that way, you, you will become self-righteous and, and legalistic. These are not things that God wants you to be. He wants you to be in Christ and from that being in Christ to then move forward. So let's read that. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, 
lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Remember, it's because we are in Christ. If we start with set your minds on things above or put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature, if you start there and say, those are the things that I have to do, if you start with that, you will fall into legalism because you will say, I've got, I've got to somehow, I've got to make that happen. But remember what it says here. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ. And for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. This is why we do these things. This is why we, this is why we put our minds on things above. This is why we put to death things that are associated with our earthly nature. That's why we do it. And it's how we do it. We put ourselves in Christ. If you're having a tough time putting your mind on things above, or you're having a tough time uh, recognizing that, um, that we need to put things um, in our lives to death, and you're having pro- problems doing that, the remedy is not to try harder. The remedy is to be in Christ. Come back and be in Christ. Continuing on here. You used to walk in these ways. That verse 7, 3 verse 7, is a, is a reflection on uh, 2 verse 6, which says, So then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. We used to walk in this way. Now you walk in, in with Christ. Okay, so he's contrasting that. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of of its creator. Here there is no Jew or Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So the gospel, the gospel brings us then to the end of this passage. It's where we started, right? It's this word picture. It's this difficult word picture. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Forgive each other as the Lord forgave you. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let, Christ, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Sing songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That word picture is only, only attainable when we're in Christ. So I hope we as a body continue to work together as a community. We need each other. We need each other in, in, in our lives to uncover some of those things. Jesus uses other people in our lives to open our eyes to to areas that we need to address. And we do need to work with Jesus in this. I had one question in the first service um, where he, he just said, so doesn't the passage actually say we need to do things? Yes, it does. It says we need to do things. That's absolutely true. And that's my, that's my desire in this, in this sermon, is to, is to bring us from just looking at the gospel to actually doing something with it. We need to pull it through our lives. How does the gospel affect your relationship with your roommate? How does the gospel affect your relationship with your spouse? How does the gospel affect how you study? How does it affect how you work? We need to pull these things through our lives. So we're going to pause here. Um, I'll take a few questions if you have any. What I would ask is that uh, you, you ask a question. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to answer the question. Please keep it on the topic that we talked about. Um, but um, if you have a question, um, go ahead and shout it out. 
I'll give it my best shot. Thank you. All right. Yep. Go to Jesus. Yep. Any questions? Come on, it's a pretty deep passage of scripture. <laughs> there has to be something there. Yep. Okay, so the question was, uh, what are some signs that you know you're being legalistic? And what are some signs that you can tell that you're being in step with the Spirit? Great question. Are there any great, any, any other great questions? No. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll reflect on my own life, okay? Because uh, I, uh, I, I came to know Jesus when I was young. And uh, I, I think I clicked into legalism pretty quick. And uh, in my own life, the things that I would, that I would reflect back to God and say, but but God, I've done these good things. I've, I've, uh, don't you see what I've given? Don't you see how I've sacrificed? Um, and, and I felt the um, expectation that I had on God was uh, I, I often found myself making deals with God. But see, God, I, I've done this, so this other thing that I, that I want, can you give that to me? The answer to that question is actually, God will not give you, he will not help you attain other gods. Okay? So if there's another, if you're saying, but God, I've, I've, I've served you well, but now can you give me this other God? God will not respond to that. He will not answer that. Um, and what I found in my own life too is that sometimes I felt that my goodness, I quotes on that, I would hold up to to God and say, but, this, but look at my goodness. The Bible actually says that um, our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. The best that we can offer to God in righteousness, okay, religion, righteousness, is disgusting to God. So we need our righteousness to come from being in Christ. And then you asked... Uh, uh, what are some signs that we're in step with the Spirit? I think, um, I think the Spirit is, like I said earlier, is very gracious in uncovering some areas in our life that He wants to deal with. And so I think as, as believers, there's always, um, I, I, I think a question that's really good to ask people too is, what is, what is God teaching you right now? Um, and I think um, if we ask ourselves that, that question, what is God teaching you? And then we really actually stop and think about it. Because I believe that God is teaching us something all the time. All the time. Um, he'll use whatever is in front of us. He'll use, in my life, he uses my kids. He uses a, a, my, my drive to work, and I see the sunrise. And I think, that's awesome. Now, what does that mean? And... It's amazing that you have the sun in the sky that just, it's common graces. It's amazing. Look at what God does in this world. He uses uh, um, scripture reading. He uses prayer. He uses um, a lot of these other things. And I think a, a, a definite sign that you're in step with the Spirit is that you, you want to run to Jesus. You want to meet with him. Um, he'll make you thirsty for, for meeting with him. Did that answer your question? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was uh, the difference between duty and legalism. So this passage clearly does call us to, to do some things in our life to change some things in our life. Um, and, and we were talking about this at my small group this afternoon. There, uh, sometimes, 
sometimes the, um, the emotion to move comes after you move. So sometimes uh, you, you, you bring discipline in your life. I don't really feel like reading scripture right now, but I, I know that scripture is going to feed me. So I'm going to do that. And then you do that, and then God meets you and makes you thirsty for more. Um, so the, the point that Paul is making in this passage, though, is in those times of discipline, because there, there are spiritual disciplines that are very important, um, and, and, and we need to work those into our lives. But if we do them from the standpoint of, um, I'm going to, this now earns me favor with God, then I call that legalism. Um, there, was a, there was a book, Transforming Grace. It's actually out here on the bookshelf. Um, there was a, a passage in that, in that book. Uh, I don't remember exactly where it was from, but it was the idea that um, if you're faced with the opportunity to share the gospel in the middle of your day, someone comes up and somehow they just, you get into this spiritual conversation with them, right? If in our minds we think, I'm not equipped to have this spiritual conversation because I didn't have my, my time in the Word today. Then I call that legalism. Because God will show up. If you are in a situation where someone says, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about heaven? Do you think it's real? And you're given the opportunity to engage someone in a spiritual conversation. If you are trusting in Jesus, you are equipped. Now, that's not to say that spending some time in the Word doesn't give you some more tools to work with there. It's ab- that's absolutely true. But um, I, I think there's that, that we, we, the minute we cross over from, uh, from without Christ to Christ, the immediate temptation that Satan's going to bring in is, all right, now let's see your religion. He's going to immediately pull us down that path. And he's going to try and get us into that legalism. And so um, the the thing that I would say when when we're looking at duty or spiritual disciplines is why are you doing them? Is it because you are in Christ and you're moving in that direction? Um, Since we are in Christ, um, that's that's the the distinction that I would make there. It's it's, It's not an easy deal. Um... Um, because there is that, um, even in the analogy of the, of the uh, frosting, right? We pull, the, we pull the gospel into our lives. But Jesus puts it there, and he works it in too. So, does that answer your question? Kind of? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I think we'll move to, to close here. So, in, in closing... I want to just come back to the gospel. Beauty, horror, love, wonder, mercy, wrath, God, transforming. Let's not just look at the gospel and say how awesome it is. It is awesome. It's amazing. It's ingenious. It's beautiful. But it's transforming. Let it change us. Pull it in. Work it into your lives. Ask yourself, what difference does the gospel make in this situation? And ask each other, what difference is the gospel making in your life? So in closing, these three, um, three last questions are, are you in Jesus? Are you in Jesus? If you're not in Jesus, if you haven't come to Jesus, it's It's fairly straightforward. We need to recognize that we are sinful. That we have a sin problem. And we need to turn from our sin and let Jesus take care of our sin. Not us. We need to leave it behind. Say, Jesus, that's yours. It's at the foot of the cross. And let me tell you, you will find yourself many times, you may find yourself coming back and saying, but i got to take care of that sin. We need to... Set it down every day. Every day. Set it down. And turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to be my sin bearer. I want you to be my Lord. 
and we turn to Jesus. And if you are already in Jesus, are you continuing to walk in him? Day by day, every day, picking up the gospel and wrestling with it. Don't give up. Be patiently persistent. So we're going to move to a time of communion now. Um, I'll ask the band to come up. And the way we practice communion here at Hope, um, it's open communion. Okay, so you don't need to be a member of Hope. You don't need to be a member of any church to take communion here at Hope. All we ask is that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you aren't a follower of Jesus Christ, you can take care of that right now. You can get in to Jesus right now before you come up. And this can be your first communion. The bread represents Jesus' body. It's symbolic. It's it's a way that we recognize that we come here and remember that Jesus paid for your sin. You You can't pay for it. He lived the life that we couldn't live and he died the death that we should have died to pay for our sins. And that's what this represents. So we celebrate that. We thank him for that. This is a time of worship and response. So let's pray.